So what this really means is that we need to have a more careful consideration in 2013 of where we want to store our configuration. So here are three different strategies that we can uh, employ. One, a SharePoint list. Simple, easy, it exists right in the same site with the workflow. Um, if we want to control who has access to changing those configuration uh, values, we can break inheritance on the SharePoint list, assign unique permissions, etc. We can call a web service. If we're storing the configuration value, um, maybe it's coming from Active Directory or it's coming from some other application, um, we can call a web service. Of course, there has to be an available web service. So if we are storing a configuration value somewhere outside of our SharePoint site uh, that we want to use from workflow, then somebody's going to have to either build a web service or a web service has to already exist, giving us access to those configuration values. And then lastly, we've got business connectivity services, a service in SharePoint, which allows us to create what's called an external list. External lists basically can read either um, SQL databases or they can call web services and they expose those external data values as a list. So the nice thing about external lists in SharePoint is that to normal end users, they look and feel like a normal SharePoint list. But instead of storing the values in the SharePoint content database, they're actually reading and writing those values from some data source, either a web service or a SQL database. The nice thing about them is there's no code. You can use SharePoint Designer to generate your external or create your external list. And so this isn't, doesn't require a developer. The same tool that you're using to create your workflow can also be used to configure your external list. And SharePoint workflows can read the values in external lists. So all of these are good choices. Um, for the most part, SharePoint lists are a very common strategy. I've used SharePoint lists myself uh, on a lot of different workflow projects. So in the demonstration workflow that we're going to be building throughout this course, we're going to be using a SharePoint list for configuration. But quite, it would be actually quite simple for us to swap out and use a BCS external list instead. So for example, in the um, sample solution, the supplemental material that comes with this class, one of the lists that gets automatically created is called workflow settings. Um, the settings list stores three columns. It's got a title, a description, and a setting column. And so we can easily come in here, define a number of different uh, uh, parameters for our workflow, and then we can simply have our workflow read into this list and pull these things out whenever it starts. So once we figured out how we want to do configuration, we also want to configure out a logging strategy. There are three different kinds of things that we typically want to think about logging from a workflow. Workflow history is simply nice, user-friendly, informational messages indicating what has been accomplished by our workflow so far. So for example, when a particular task gets approved, we might write a workflow history message indicating who uh, completed uh, the approval, when, etc. Diagnostics are a technical log where we track the internal state of our workflow variables. So workflows that you're going to see as we build our sample workflow that it's even with a fairly simple workflow, you'll end up with dozens of different variables keeping track of different different aspects of the running workflow instance. So we might be keeping track of uh, which tasks are currently been assigned. We might keep track of different dates. We might be calculating certain numbers. All of that are tracked through these internal variables. One of the difficult challenges with supporting a workflow is that when something goes wrong, often is not what's gone wrong is we got a calculation wrong, or when we tried to read some particular list value, something didn't work out the way we thought it would. So the only way to really know what happened in our workflow is we need to inspect the value of all of these different variables. And there are no tools out of the box with SharePoint Workflow that, that allow us to take a peek inside the workflow engine and take a look at the value of, of, the, of these variables for a running workflow. So 
first time workflow authors deploying you know workflow solutions often find that workflows are very very difficult to support in production when things start going wrong it's often very difficult to know why so one of the things we can do to uh, prepare for that is include diagnostics, i.e. we log out the value of our internal variables to some sort of an external uh, data source so that when something goes wrong, we can go take a look at that diagnostic and analyze all the different data. And then lastly, we wanna track performance. So how long and how many of things occurred? So as we run multiple instances of a workflow, managers typically wanna know uh, durations and counts. They wanna know how many instances of a workflow ran, and they wanna know how long the particular stages and steps inside that workflow took to complete. So I call this the performance audit. Out of the box, SharePoint Workflow only gives us one logging source. They give us what's called the workflow history. The workflow history is displayed on the overall workflow status for every running workflow. And users um, can go and look at this and see this list of sort of messages. Because the workflow history list is the only one that's provided out of the box, workflow designers historically have tried to use this for everything. They will use it to, to inform a user of what's happening in a workflow. They will log diagnostic information to it, and they'll also try to log out performance information. The problem is, is you've got three different audiences for that information, and you're trying to use one list for all three of them. What ends up happening is this list gets bloated. You end up putting all this different information in here, which means that none of the users are particularly satisfied. If a workflow user comes in to see what's happening on the workflow, they're gonna see all of these different diagnostic messages they don't understand. And if a manager comes in to try and track the performance aspects, um, the performance rows are gonna get mixed in with everything else. So in general, it's not a good idea to use workflow history for anything other than history, i.e. short, user-friendly informational messages. There's also a good technical reason not to use the workflow history for either diagnostics or performance. Who knows why, but the workflow history is not designed for what's called large list. Standard workflow uh, SharePoint lists um, have a performance constraint that once they get up to a few thousand rows, they can start to suffer performance problems. There is what's called large list strategies in SharePoint that allow us to scale a list up to millions of items. The two strategies are indexes, so we can manually go and create indexes on individual columns, similar to how we might optimize a table in SQL Server, or we can use folders, or we use both. So for whatever reason, historically, the workflow history list has not implemented either folders or indexes. And so what this means is that as we log more and more information into the workflow history list, it potentially has the problem of hitting the threshold. Um, in SharePoint 2010 and 2013, that threshold was about 5,000 rows. It can start to get very, very slow. Unfortunately, if you're logging out 10 or 20 messages on every instance of a workflow, and you run 10 or 20 instances of that workflow every single day, how many days does it take before we've written thousands of rows out to the workflow history? Not that many days. So A, there's two things we really need to understand about the workflow history list. A, write as little as possible into it. And B, we do need to figure out how we trim it. There are, there's a special timer job in SharePoint um, that people mistakenly think go and clean up the workflow history list. By default, there's a special timer job that runs every 60 days that um, is called a workflow cleanup. Um, a lot of people mistakenly believe that the workflow cleanup actually goes and deletes items out of the history list, which is not true. It does clean up workflow um, history associations and it does clean up tasks, but it does not actually delete any of the workflow history out of the workflow history list. So what does typically happen is this history list gets bigger and bigger and bigger and nobody's cleaning up and it gets slower and slower and slower. And because this, this, um, these history items are queried every time we view a workflow history status page, 
it slows down the performance a lot. So what I really recommend, the long and the short of this, is we really need to think about three different ways for logging three different kinds of workflow status. So in terms of addressing diagnostics and performance audit log, similar to configuration, we've got three different choices. We can use a custom SharePoint list. We can push the information out by calling a web service, or we can configure a BCS external list to either a relational database or a web service call. All three of these are good choices. Um, in the sample workflow that we're going to build, we're going to be using a custom SharePoint list. So just to give you an example, the supplemental uh, workflow solutions that are included with the course, another list that gets created is called the diagnostic log. This includes a number of different columns that allow us to track diagnostic information logged from each workflow. So we have a bunch of different columns that help us track the individual instance like the association name, the workflow instance ID, list ID, et cetera. And then we've got a few different um, fields where we can actually log data. So we can log the current stage, the current step, and we've got a catch-all data column where we can just dump in a bunch of variable values, et cetera. Because we could be logging a lot of information to these particular lists, they are configured for performance. So we've gone in and we've created indexes on them. And so you can see that basically we want to create an index on every column that we're going to use for sorting, grouping, or filtering. This is done through the SharePoint browser UI. So when we go into a particular list settings, we can go in and we can create up to 20 indexes. And so the sandbox solutions that are included with the supplemental material for the list that I create we can go in and uh, these, these indexes have automatically been provisioned. The second list that's created is called the performance log. Similar to the diagnostic log, it uses a custom content type and it has a number of different columns that help us keep track of counts and durations. So there are some columns here which are used to track for grouping, sorting, and filtering. We've got the stage, we've got the step, we've got an outcome column, etc. And we've also got a couple of columns for tracking when the particular event started and when it ended. This will allow us to calculate the duration. So what we can get out of these particular performance logs is we can get counts, and we can get performance in terms of durations, and we can sort, group, and filter by the stage, the step or the particular outcome. So this is an example of what that log might look like. For an instance of a workflow, invoice approval, we're logging out different stages. We've got different outcomes so we can track which stages or steps uh, produced an approval or a rejection. And we can calculate the duration of each one of these steps or stages. And that completes the lecture for Module 3, Initiation, Configuration, and Logging.